being connected to the internet while you're on the road is no longer just a luxury. For many, it's become a necessity. So if you stick around and watch this video, I'm going to kind of take away some of those phobias and complications that make things a lot harder than they really are. All right, stick around. Today I'm going to talk to you about something that I really love doing, which is staying connected to the internet and I love technology and I've been doing this type of stuff for uh, 10 or 20 years and I've learned to really cut through the fog of complications. It's not really that hard. A lot of people make this so much harder than it really is. They talk about multiple cell plans and they always are trying to chase the best deal. And I'm not going to sit here today and tell you exactly what the cheapest deal is, the best deal, uh, because everybody is different. Everybody has a different cell plan. Everybody lives in a different state, a different area. They have family plans, individual plans, business plans, senior plans, buy as you go, prepaid, post -play, paid, all that stuff. And it just makes it really complicated. And I'm not going to do that. I can tell you historically and from my point of view what I've found to be the best. I live in California and most of the places I travel I get very good coverage with T-Mobile and as a backup I use AT&T. As far as customer service I love T-Mobile but at the end of the day most people say hey you know what I don't need good customer service I just want to stay connected and I want the best speeds. So T-Mobile is not the best in every area, but guess what? Neither is Verizon, neither is AT&T. So I find that having two carrier plans is really the best way to go for me. So that being said, I have a family plan. It's a senior plan, as a matter of fact, with T-Mobile. It's, it's about as economical as any go out there. But what makes it nice is you can add on a, a tablet SIM for an extra $20. And that's, that's not too bad. And um, I challenge anybody to go out and try to do better than that. When you put a tablet SIM into other devices, the carrier, like T-Mobile, can sense what kind of device that is in. So a lot of these carriers now have gotten um, quite creative with proprietary lockdown to their devices. The key issue is if you buy a high-speed data plan and you put it in your iPhone, for example, and that's what you're paying for, or actually more so a dedicated hotspot, like for example from Verizon, and you find a way to take the chip out, the SIM card out, and put it into a tablet, there's a great chance that they're gonna see that and they're gonna bring that speed down. And you know, you can kinda of, you know, circumvent that occasionally, but I haven't had a lot of success and I have watched many a good posts on several forums that uh, guys will go through all various efforts to try to um, circumvent that throttling as it's called. So uh, that being said, you have to be prepared that if you buy a SIM card, even though it's um, unlimited data, and even if they say they don't throttle it, most of the time you're going to get throttled when you take that SIM card and put it into a device that it was not what they call provisioned for. And this is the problem is if you pick up your cell phone and you put that SIM card in from Verizon and it's a Verizon phone, then it's provisioned to that carrier and they'll give you top tier status. If I say, oh gee, well I wanna take that SIM card and I'm gonna put it in my iPad, they can see the fact that that took that high speed iPhone card and put it into a different iPad, like maybe an unlocked iPad or a, maybe even another um, device that's that's maybe a different carrier. And they, they will sometimes even block it if it's from a different carrier. I've had that happen where I put a Verizon card into a T-Mobile phone and no can do. So you have to be ready for that. But um, I've had pretty good luck having, for example, a T-Mobile tablet add-on SIM card and I've put that in other devices and also my router that I'm going to tell you about. So you have to kind of look at different options for you. Um, every, every plan does not match and meet everybody's needs. And there are uh, buy as you go plans, which I've had brutal hard luck with. I've tried with Verizon and literally lost part of my hair. Um, 
their tech support, there is none. There's no customer service when you buy a card. When you go into Walmart, you're on your own. If you buy that $75 one month all you can eat uh, data card, I'm, I'm gonna tell you right now, I've done that several times and you are literally on your own. Because you don't have an account with them, you can't call in if you have a problem and unless you provision that in a Verizon device, you're gonna have a lot of headaches. Um, I have made it work, but it's not easy. Okay, so let's talk about speeds. You don't need a lot of speed to do email. You don't need any speed to do text messaging. What you need to have is 4G and above coverage, LTE 4G and above. If you, if you have an area that's 3G or even sometimes lower, if it says an E in your display, you're in trouble. I don't care what you're gonna do. So no plan is gonna get you out of hot water when you're just in weak services. So you gotta do your homework. You gotta find the, the actual uh, carrier that's gonna be good in that particular area. Which means if you're traveling, guess what? Chances are you're gonna hit those black spots. Good news is those black spots are getting fewer and fewer and fewer. Even with uh, what used to be the underdog, T-Mobile, I'll tell you, there are very few spots, but there are black spots. There's black spots for AT&T and Verizon as well. If you have a high speed connection, a 4G and LTE connection, you're, you're in pretty good shape provided you're not getting throttled down and you can do speed checks and this is not gonna get you into the world of what throughput, what bandwidth will help. But I'm just going to tell you, if you do a speed test in these different areas with speedtest.net, um, you can use the app or the actual website. Historically speaking, I'm gonna tell you, if you're, if you're somewhat above the four to six megabits per second, if you see more than four to six, you're in good shape to do just about anything you need. Yeah, some emails and certainly photos that you send are gonna be a little bit slower, but with the optimization that video is um, providing through places like YouTube, I've had pretty good luck getting YouTube feed on as low as six megabits, megabits per second. So just think of it as a speedometer. If you see six and above, you're in pretty good shape. Most of the time with T-Mobile, I'm getting 10 anywhere to 20 to 25. And comparatively, if I were to pick up my iPhone and I did a T-Mobile speed check right now, I could be getting over 100, 125. If I put that same chip in my iPad or the router, I, it may bring me down to 20, 25, but I don't get stressed out about it anymore because the, the, the fact of the matter is it, it works. And I use YouTube TV. And I'm not going to get into the whole deal about you know who to subscribe to and whether you use Hulu or Firestick or Apple TV. I'm a big proponent of Apple products. So I have Apple TVs, I have iPads, I have iPhones, and it allows me to stream across the platforms just absolutely like magic. I use YouTube TV. Um, I don't use DirecTV, I don't use Dish TV anymore. I don't like those services and here's the big reason. YouTube TV, that service always records to their cloud so I can set up all my DVR recordings, all the things I want to watch on the road, no matter where, no matter when, it's recording in the background. Try doing that to DirecTV or Dish, you can't. You gotta set the Dish up and you gotta record. We made that mistake. For a year we subscribed to DirecTV and we, we couldn't watch any of our shows because we were always on the, on the road. So our direct TV wasn't set up. So that's enough said about that. I subscribe to YouTube TV, but the reason why I'm tell, telling you that is I'm saying that YouTube TV is optimized. I get great streaming and it's great. So that's the uh, world of connection, carrier plans, speeds, throttling, and some of the caveats to coverage. So how do we get that carrier internet into our RV world? Our RV world has to have a mobile network. Now, don't get messed up on this. It's super, super easy. It's the exact same thing as your home. You're gonna set up a network just like your home. You want a router just like your home. You're gonna create Steve's RV and that's gonna be your network name. And then you're gonna give yourself a password and nobody else can get onto it. Why do this? 
because I'm a strong advocate of keeping one network as you travel. And every single device connects to that network, whether it's an iPhone, an iPad, an Apple TV, a Hulu, Fire Stick, your cameras, all of your security cameras if you have them, your dog camera, your temperature reader, your systems monitor, every single device that you've got that needs internet connection, I'm advocating strongly that you connect it to one single network in your coach. The reason why is because then everything is protected under the same umbrella, one network protected by that router, and that router has a firewall, and that router then brings a signal in from the outside. So if you haven't already done it, grab a piece of paper because you're probably already going to want to write down some notes. So number one is you want to have a single network for your RV travels. You don't want to start connecting all your devices to the campground's Wi-Fi. First of all, campground Wi-Fi's historically are the pits. Very, very few campgrounds have enough speed to even get you past the level of an email. Now, some high-end resorts out there are actually feeding individual fiber optic to your actual site, and that's pretty neat. You gotta have something ready to connect that ethernet cable into your coach though. But what I wanna strongly advocate is you have one device now that connects to the outside world. So there we go, point being, one single network, one device now connects to the outside world. Not a bunch of different devices, because guess what's gonna happen? As soon as you leave that Wi-Fi source, if you had 10 different devices, I, I can't even imagine, 10, 15, 20 different devices all connected to the campground Wi-Fi, and you leave the campground, what's gonna happen? Well, <laughs> you're gonna be at the next stop, the next Wi-Fi signal, you're gonna be trying to put in a whole nother 10 or 20 different devices, network setups, all your TV, your Apple TV, your Hulu, your Fire Stick, everything, another password, you have to get connected, and some of those have portals in which it makes you authorize connecting their network with some other advertisement or something. Not a good way to go bad idea. You want to have a single source for all your devices to stay connected to. You're going to set them up one time, one time only, one single network name, one single network password, and that's all you need to do because they're always going to stay connected to Steve's RV network or whatever network name you use. The next phase is we have ways of connecting to the internet. I already discussed one, an ethernet cable, a fiber optic cable can come and plug right into your router. Or the router can have a hotspot that it grabs onto. The hotspot could be in front of a Starbucks. The hotspot could be the Wi-Fi at the campground, which we already said, they're no good. You don't wanna do Starbucks either because when you leave, it's, it's just gonna go away. So that leaves the third source of an internet connection. And that's what we talked about in the very beginning, which was wireless carrier, cellular, carriers, mobile internet, such as T-Mobile, AT&T, Sprint, Verizon, and a number of other subsidiary companies that requires a data plan with them. But you need to have a SIM card. So the SIM card's gonna go into your router. Now, before I go further, a lot of people are gonna say, wait, 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 time out. I got a Jetpack, I got a Verizon Jetpack and it works great. I got a T-Mobile um, hotspot. Why can't I use that? Hey, why can't I use my iPhone? Uh, my iPhone has a personal hotspot on here. I can turn this baby on right here and, and uh, right there I can put my hotspot on and now everything devices. I don't like that. First of all, let's talk about the iPhone because when that iPhone goes away and goes with you, guess what happens? That hotspot goes away with your iPhone. So everything loses its connection. The other thing is, you may not know it, but most of the data plans that are attached to a, a device like an iPhone, they don't let you connect to that iPhone at high speed. They'll limit that personal hotspot speed to something that's only gonna get you standard quality, not high definition, which most of the sources online now are high definition HD, and you, you want that, because most TVs are capable of showing you high definition signals and so you want to have a faster connection. I know there are some plans that will enable you to connect to this 
at a speed high enough to do all that HD streaming. I, I'm not going to argue that point, but I am going to argue that while this may be the go-to cheapest solution out of the box, I will not argue that point. It's not the best solution for the robustness and the multi-purpose use. It won't shut down and you don't have to worry about your battery on your iPhone getting sucked dry and then all of a sudden you're going to go out for the fun and guess what? Now your iPhone's battery is dead. So. I don't like that, no bueno, not my recommendation. Jetpacks, let's argue that. Do jetpacks work? Yeah, they do. Um, I don't like the power, and I'm gonna get in trouble when I when I say this because there's, there's a few um, resources out on the internet that talk about the value of a jetpack. And um, the jetpacks, um, they serve a function. I just don't like the function they serve, which is, it's a fairly low powered device as far as pulling in a signal and broadcasting it. So the limitations of a, of a jet pack kind of outweigh the, the utility. You know, I'm not gonna argue the fact that if, if you've got one, you got the plan, it works, it's smoking hot, and you got a great deal on it, you know, that, that'll work for you. I'm not telling you to go out and spend $1,000. If your jet pack is working great and you're getting a good bargain on it, then okay, you can do that. But that's really not the focus of this video. The focus of this video is what's the best bang for the buck? What am I using that I find really works well? So let's talk about that. I like to use a pep wave. Currently I'm using the Transit Duo. One of the great things about the Transit Duo is it's a dual router. Up here, there are two different modem slots. In each modem slot, there are two slots for each modem. That doesn't mean I get four carriers at the same time. It means I've got two modems, two carriers at the same time. It's the bee's knees. It gives you everything that you would want right now. This Transit Duo is really a lot nicer than the BR1 Max from Pepwave I had before. Because the BR1 Max had two SIM slots, but it only had one modem. So what that meant is I could put a T-Mobile card in and an AT&T card in, and I could only get one of those carries at a single time. And whenever one of those would drop down, I would have to restart this connection in that modem, which took a couple minutes, and you'd lose your connection completely. Not so with the Transit. The Transit Duo has two modems that are running simultaneously, and you can prioritize which one of those you want. You can also put the SIM card in modem A versus modem B, so that you're always gonna give the priority to one over the other. You can do that through the software as well. But the nice thing about that is both carriers are connected at the same time. So if you're traveling, and your signal gets weaker, it'll switch over to the other carrier. If you're stationary and you're in a campground and you want to see which signal's better, at and is better, it's no problem. It'll switch over that without you doing anything, really. Um, but normally I just set it up one time and it's, it's, it's pretty simple to do. You notice I'm not doing a big unboxing video. It's just not necessary. Everybody knows how to open a box. Everybody knows how to take a device out of the box. All you got to do is take this out. You screw the antennas in. It's pretty simple. You got a couple of Wi-Fi antennas. You got a, a few um, cellular antennas and that's all you got to do. That's the hardest thing about it is making sure those antennas go on the right port. This is super simple to set up. Once those antennas are in, once your SIM cards are plugged in, you plug the unit in and you go to the software. I've used Cradle Point software. There's actually two things I didn't like about the Cradle Point. The Cradle Point has a SIM card cover, and believe it or not, that SIM card cover has a micro switch on it. That SIM card cover has to be on and screwed down, which kind of limits your ability to get in there and make a quick SIM card switch. Um, that being said, if you're one of those people who doesn't care and you never switch your SIM cards, it won't really hold you back. But I liked having that completely open. And you can't see it really well here, but over here, there are four slots here and they're all exposed. So I actually have three SIM cards in there. I've got a uh, T-Mobile, I got AT&T, and I have a Verizon um, standby. This Transit Duo costs just shy of $1,000. The BR1 that I used before was around 700. So to me, it was a no brainer, easy decision to go to the dual modem. So some people may argue, 
uh, about a cradle point. While cradle point has some very sophisticated high end features, I'm comfortable in saying that not many RV travelers are gonna need that, even if you're doing business on the road. And if you were to configure it like this one is, it will cost you in excess of $2,000. I know because I went right to the source and I said, Cradle Point, here's what I wanna do. I wanna get a Pep Wave Transit Duo configured style Cradle Point. Is that going to be possible? And they said, it's absolutely possible. To be honest with you, you're gonna be way north of 2,000. You're probably gonna be pushing 24 to 2,600 to get uh, the same features. This Transit Duo from Pepwave is working great. Where did I get it? I got it at 5G Store. Now I will give props to 5G Store. I'm not getting paid by them. I'll put a link in the comment section below. I, I am comfortable saying 5G Store, their customer service is, is mind-blowingly good. When you call there, you get a very clear, easy to understand person here uh, in the United States. And it's kind of funny because they don't work for Pepwave, but they know that product so well. So I strongly recommend calling 5G Store. They have a great website and it's, it's super easy to order from them. You get your stuff really quickly and that's all you need. You can stop right there. And I guarantee you, this is gonna make you look back and go, wow, that was a lot easier than I ever imagined. And is it the only way you can do this? No. Is it the way that works really good and it's a lot less moving parts for me, it is. Am I absolutely confident in recommending it to you? Absolutely. The only variables that I can tell you would be your individual carrier and plan. And friends, I'm gonna tell you that could change tomorrow for me too. But right now, I've got the plans, it works for me. You get the plans that work for you, put them into your, your Pepwave Transit Duo, and you're off to the races. This will stay up and running your whole time. It'll give you connection as you're traveling. It'll give you the ability to access your motorhome from afar. So if you have remote monitoring systems, whether it's for battery or temperature or dogs, webcams, whatever, it'll always stay up and running. It's really a great way to go. You can't do that when you have a personal hotspot like an iPhone connected. Once it goes, you're done. That pretty much wraps it up. If you have questions, feel free to put them in the comment section below. I hope you found that useful and more so I hope it simplified things and kind of demystified this subject matter because it's, it's really not that hard. All right, have a, a great day and safe travels to you all and we'll see you on the next video.